Welcome to our 2019 Black History Month celebration. My name is Leon Jones III, and I will serve as your Master of Ceremonies for today's program. Now will you please stand for the posting of the colors. Color guard, post. Post the colors. Order on. Post. Freeze it. Audience, you may now be seated and please welcome to the podium Chancellor Alexander and Miss Angelica Perkins, the 89th Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, directly following the Chancellor. Good morning. Good morning. Not quite Chancellor Alexander, but I get to sit in for her. My name is Robert Carr. I'm the Provost and Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And I have the wonderful opportunity to welcome you to our Black History Month speaker program. And we have a wonderful and dynamic speaker, Mr. Mark Moriel. I want to talk to you just for a second about the University of Arkansas and Pine Bluff uh, and what we do for our students and the community. Individually and collectively, the students at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, which has a mission as a public research institution uh, to promote and sustain excellent academic programs that integrate quality instruction, research, and student learning experiences that are responsive to the needs of racial, racially, culturally, and economically diverse student population. Our university is dedicated to providing access and opportunity to academically deserving students and producing graduates who are equipped to excel through their contributions and leadership in the 21st century, century both national and globally. I am proud to serve as Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff because it gives us an opportunity to really mold and shape our future students. At this time, I'm going to invite our Chancellor, Chancellor Lawrence Alexander, to the podium to save me on this welcome. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Carr, for filling in so admirably. And uh, didn't Dr. Carr do a good job? Yes, indeed. That's our provost. Yes, indeed. So welcome. Welcome to our Black History Month celebration here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It's indeed a pleasure to extend our sincere appreciation to each of you for taking a moment out of your schedule to join us for this celebration. We'd like to especially recognize former Chancellor Blakely, who's here today. And do we have any other former chancellors who are here today? No? Yeah. Do we have any elected officials here today? We'd like to recognize you. Any? No? Well, good. We're all native golden lions in the room. Uh, and any community supporters who are here, we certainly are glad that you took the time out to share with us today. Certainly, 
but not least, we are glad to have with us today our very special guest, the Honorable Mark Morial, who, who will be delivering our message today. We are delighted to have uh, Mark Morial with us as a person I have known for a long time, comes from a great family who has achieved greatness in his own life. And he hails from a great city, which he and his father admirably and magnificently led from the late 70s into the 80s, and then through your terms in the 90s and early 2000s. That's black history. As a historically black university filled with a rich history, it is important that we pay tribute and give honor to those who have sacrificed their lives and paved the way and had the courage to make valuable contributions to our university, our community, our city, and our state and nation. It is a must that we recognize our past and become knowledgeable of where we've been to understand our path while we're moving forward to a better future. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other greats have often said that African Americans must assert their sense of self-worth. Well, Black History Month reminds us all that the story of African Americans add up to just that, a truly majestic sense of worth. At this time, we celebrate the achievements of African Americans in every field, from science to the arts, to politics, to religion, and beyond. Black History Month connects us with one another, and it offers all Americans, all Americans, an occasion and opportunity to gain a fuller perspective on the contributions of African Americans to our nation. So let's appreciate the opportunity. Let's build on it. Again, we appreciate you for attending and coming and celebrating this delightful occasion with us. Without further ado, let's hear from the best for Thank you. I'm sorry, I took it out of order. Let's hear from, let's hear another welcome from, all right, that's right, from Miss Angelica Perkins, Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Greetings to our Chancellor and his esteemed cabinet, family, friends, and distinguished guests. My name is Angelica Perkins. I gratefully serve as the 89th Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. What a delight it is to have you with us this morning as we listen to the wise words of Mark Morial. It is an honor to have living history with us at this university as we are celebrating Black History Month. So today, may you soak up this experience enjoy the speech, and cherish this knowledge. Thank you.
Great job, Best Require. Following that great performance will be our Student Government Association President, Ms. Kimberly Boyd. Greetings, I am Kimberly Boyd, a senior excelling in business marketing, hailing from Memphis, Tennessee, and humbly serving as your 2018-2019 Student Government Association President. I have the honor of introducing who Ebony Magazine described as one of the most influential figures in the black community, Mr. Mark Morial. He began his journey as a premier student at the University of Pennsylvania, where he received his degree in economics and African American studies. He also holds numerous honorary degrees from such universities as Xavier and Howard University. As mayor of New Orleans, Morial was a popular chief executive who led the city's 1990s renaissance. He left office with a 70% approval rate. Have accomplished that, he gained recognition from President Barack Obama, who appointed him to serve as chair of Census Advisory Committee, a member of the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability, and on the Department of Education's Equity and Excellence Commission. He was also appointed to the 21st Century Workforce Commission by President Bill Clinton. Therefore, having a professional career that has spanned over 25 years, Mr. Mark Morial has performed all of these roles with excellence and is one of the most accomplished serving leaders in this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, entrepreneur, lawyer, professor, legislator, mayor, and CEO of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historical civic rights and urban advocacy organization, Mr. Mark Morial. Thank you very much, Kimberly. I appreciate the uh, warm introduction, and I want to certainly uh, congratulate and thank Angelica and uh, the, uh, the Chief Justice of the uh, University of uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff Supreme Court. Do you know the Chief Justice? Uh, give them a hand, the student leaders, all the student leaders. Uh, let me thank uh, Chancellor uh, Alexander for coming back. He was on important duty at the uh, Arkansas State Legislature where the interests of the school have to always be guarded and watched. And so thank you, Mr. Chancellor, for coming back uh, to be with us this morning. Let me say how much I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this morning, uh, to celebrate, to recognize Black History Month. But also, you are Black History. This university is Black History. Your, the students here are tomorrow's black history. Black history is always being made. Always being made. And we need to remember that. I just want to begin with a short story. Uh, and it's a story I went back to New Orleans after I had gone up to Philadelphia and later to Washington, D.C., to undergraduate school uh, and later law school. Uh, and I couldn't wait to get back to New Orleans because I wanted to get me some good New Orleans food. <laughs> couldn't find it in Philadelphia. I couldn't find it in Washington, D.C. So I went on down, went right on back to one of my favorite little places. You know, it's one of these places where you can get greasy grits and eggs and homemade grandma biscuits. I mean, real good food, $2.29 for all you can eat. Uh, and the place which was near where I grew up, uh, next door to it, there was also another business establishment uh, that uh, is not, was always common in the neighborhood, uh, a liquor store. And right next to it, there was an ice house where they sold ice to people who would go fishing. And in the old days, uh, people used ice, purchased ice uh, for various purposes. And as I was walking into the restaurant, I hear uh, this uh, fella uh, calling my name, hey, 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 hey. Uh, and there were three guys, and they were, not, they were standing not in front of the ice house, they were standing in front of the liquor store. And uh, I looked over, and it was uh, three of my childhood friends that I had grown up with, and uh, two of them had not made it to anybody's university. 
Uh, and uh, he called me out and he said, you know, uh, there you, he says, I, I heard you uh, went to some fancy schools up on the East Coast and you got a bunch of degrees. He said, I think you even have more degrees than a thermometer now. And he said, I got a question for you because I, I still think I know more than you. So he challenged me. He said, you know, what is the best nation on earth? What is the best nation on earth? So I'm, first of all, I'm saying the best nation on earth is the United States of America. He says, no, you're wrong. I said, well, then the, ne the best nation on earth is Saints Nation. Because at that point in time, the Saints were winning some ball games, and everybody was excited. He said, no, you're wrong again. And I'm thinking, what does he have up his sleeve? He says, he says look, if I give you, he says, look, if I give you the right answer, he says, I'm going to need something from you. And he said, the best nation on earth is a donation. And I want a donation from you right now. <laughs> so I was hey, That reunion cost me $5 at the time, which was someone just coming out of college. After a five was a lot of money. I pulled out one. He said, no, that ain't enough. I want a real donation. Uh, give me five. Let me take everyone back 400 years to the year 1619. 1619 in Hampton, Virginia. 20 Africans on a Dutch merchant ship landed on the shores in Hampton, Virginia, not too far from Jamestown. The ship was actually destined for either the Caribbean or South America. And it ended up in Hampton. 20 Africans described at the time as indentured servants were on that vessel. They were on that vessel because they had been promised, as was the custom, that as indentured servants, if they worked on the vessel, and help the explorers on that vessel when, the, when they landed for a period of time that they would earn their freedom. Well, slavery was born when the promise to them was reneged on. And they became not indentured servants, but they became the property of other people and enslaved for life. And their children. And their children's children. And their children's 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 children were enslaved for life. And that 400 years ago, Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, was the beginning of that peculiar institution that institution which stands as one of the most heinous acts of mass terrorism in humankind, American slavery, was born 400 years ago. 10 years ago, 10 years and almost one month to the day, on the National Mall on a bitterly cold and clear day, January 20th, 2009 to be exact, a fellow by the name of Barack Obama was raising his hand to become the president of the United States of America. 390 years later, 390 years later to be exact. In, that trans in the period that transpired, from 1619 all the way to 2009 and now to 2019. People of African descent, notwithstanding chains and barbarism, 
notwithstanding rape and terror, notwithstanding subjugation, slavery, and segregation, made tremendous contributions to the North American soil. Those contributions were in art, they were in literature, they were in science, they were in music, they were in agriculture, they were in astronomy, they were in every conceivable, every conceivable element and aspect of human existence. And one might ask, how could an enslaved people subject to chains and barbarism and terrorism, restrictions on movement, restrictions on reading, restrictions on learning, make contributions of such a significant nature to the making of North America and to be exact, the United States of America. It is because when Africans came to this country. They brought with them thousands of years of kingdoms and culture, thousands of years of building and architecture and mathematics and astronomy and science and carpentry and ironworking and masonry to the shores of the United States of America. The success of agriculture in America, whether it be tobacco or cotton or sugarcane or corn or peanuts, was enhanced because of the agricultural knowledge base of Africans who came to America. Africans who came to America didn't come devoid of language, skills, and culture. When we study this snapshot of black history or African American history, we are studying but a narrow slice of the contributions of people of African descent not only to North America, not only to the United States of America, but to the existence of this global community. And Carter G. Woodson, the legendary, and you need to know the name, say Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson, Carter G. Woodson was the founder of Black History Month and its predecessor, Negro History Week. And Carter G. Woodson was the son of a slave who achieved academic excellence. He was a black man with a bachelor's in literature in 1903 from Brea College. A black man who in the early 1900s got master's degrees from the University of Chicago and a PhD from Harvard University, who had studied in his formal works the contributions of Europeans and people of European descent to American life but began his own exploration, self-study, discovery, and writing of the contributions of Africans to North America and to the United States of America. And Carter G. Woodson said, let's just set aside one week. But he knew, as he wrote in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, that part of American history was regrettably a systematic effort to downplay, diminish, and erase the contributions 
of people of African descent to North America and the United States of America, and designed to suggest that people of African descent were inferior, subhuman, of second class status, and deserved what they got, which was slavery, and deserved segregated status. The system was a system of psychological brainwashing. Brainwash people who were white into believing that they were innately superior and that God somehow ordained it. And convincing people who were black that God ordained them to be second class and subjugated and worthless. And Carter G. Woodson, it burned in his soul, but he was an intellectual activist. He didn't join a picket line, but he wrote articles and books. He didn't file any lawsuits, but he created an organization dedicated to the study of Negro life, as it was called then, African American Black Life and History. This is what Carter G. Woodson did. There's no excuse for this generation of college students not to have a working and indeed encyclopedic knowledge of the contributions, Chancellor, of people of African descent, whether it is Garrett Morgan or Carter G. Woodson or Crispus Attucks or Lena Horne or Barack Obama or Frederick Douglass or Nat Turner or Martin Delaney or PBS Pinchback or Doug Wilder. There's no excuse today. We can't say, well, they didn't teach it to me in school. So what? I got a computer and a cell phone and I can look anything up. And I can educate myself. You want to be a great industrial technologist? I invite you to go online and look at the list of all of the great people of African descent who have held patents in this country. You want to be a great judge or lawyer? I invite you to go online and learn not only about Thurgood Marshall and Johnny Cochran, but Drew Days and Wade McCree and William Henry Hasty, the first black to ever be a federal district court judge. You want to be a great educator or teacher. Online you can learn of Janetta Cole or Benjamin Mays or, or any of the great African-American men and women who are educators. This generation has at the tip of its hand knowledge and information on these contributions. You don't need a book. You don't need a class room or a PowerPoint. You can learn it with your own curiosity with your own determination, because you say deep down in your soul, I am going to know about myself. And knowing about myself is the only way I will ensure that I can be great. I can fulfill my dreams. And I can accomplish what I want. So in this Black History Month, I'm inviting all of you not to look at Black History Month as just a time 
for a nostalgic remembrance of a few great black heroes. But as a time when we each make a personal commitment to better educate ourselves, to delve and to learn, to understand that the 30 to 40 to 50 great personalities we learn about, Harriet Tubman or George Washington Carver or Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. Du Bois or Carter G. Woodson are just scratching the surface of all of the great contributors to this. Think about what it took in 1873 when this institution was founded just after slavery ended. How did they have the vision and the idea I don't think there was a bank loan waiting around to help them start a college. I don't think the powers that be said, come on down home, give you all the technical assistance you need. But we have to understand it was enabled by the power that came with the end of segregation, which was the right to vote which put blacks in the Arkansas legislature in the 1870s and that they demanded that the state create educational opportunities for newly freed slaves. It was the exercise of political power that came from voting that helped to birth this institution. We need to know about history, the use of power to build institutions. Those institutions being about lifting up each and every generation. So I'm asking all of you, yes the students and yes all of us who used to be students, to make a new commitment. We have to understand our contributions, we can't educate other communities if we don't know it. We can't be proud and strong if we don't recognize it. And there's a role model for each and every one of you in the pages of African American history who's done what you want to do or who scratched the surface upon whose shoulders you will stand. You will stand. So let me just, before I work on closing, because we're going to have some Q&As, talk about the here and the now. I want to say, first of all, we have, in 2020, an important election coming up. I don't want to hear no excuses about not voting in 2020. I want every one of you who's 18 and over to understand that we have to use the power that we have if we expect the people we elect to be accountable to us. And we can't be tricked, bamboozled, dissuaded, and psychologically played on like what happened in 2016. See, in 2016, the press has done a poor job covering the Senate Intelligence Committee report. Let me tell you what it says. The Russian Federation set up its own Black Lives Matter Instagram page, posing as being legitimate. but whose messages and content were being driven from Moscow. 
That Black Lives in Instagram page carried messages such as, don't waste your time voting. All the candidates you're being told to vote for are going to sell you out. You need to stand up for Black Lives Matter and not vote. And they recruited 300,000 followers. And most people thought that it was totally a legit Instagram page. And it was as fake as can be. Because these foreign players figured we can manipulate young people in America. They ain't so in love with Instagram and the internet that whatever they see, they're going to believe. We need to not, we need to put our foot down and we need to say we will not be bamboozled or manipulated ever again. See, watch. Watch the thread, brothers and sisters. During the days of segregation, and slavery, it was justified by psychological warfare. Manipulation of white and black people. Manipulation of bond. You are in slavery and segregation because you're second class, you're subhuman, you can't learn, your brain is smaller. White Americans were told you're on top because you're better, and God ordained it, and you were born that way. And by the way, the blacks are inferior. Psychological warfare. Then in 2016, once again, psychological warfare. This time focused on voting. We cannot be bamboozled. We have vote suppressors who want to make people have specific forms of photo IDs. We have vote suppressors who want to cancel early voting. We have vote suppressors that want to close down precincts. And we have vote suppressors from outside of the shores who want to manipulate our minds. So number one, we must vote in 2020 to send a powerful message that enough is enough. Number two, for every single one of you, I know you're committed, and I'm going to encourage you to get that degree. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't get tired. Don't get dejected. Don't get your head down. We know it's hard, and it's tough. No one said it was easy. How hard was it for Harriet Tubman? On her knees in the forests of Maryland with coyotes and raccoons and bears with no flashlight. How difficult was it for Frederick Douglass to get lashed and lashed and lashed until he said, I'm going to run away and escape from this horrible situation. No matter what burden we're carrying today, it isn't the burden that the people who came before us carry. It ain't as heavy. It's not as difficult. And while we think it is as challenging, it is challenging, but it is not. So we owe it to ourselves to give it our best and never give in. Number three, I am going to ask all of you that when success comes your way, as it will, and you achieve your dreams and your greatness, don't forget from where you came. Don't forget.
Don't forget your neighborhood, your church, your family, your friends. Don't turn your back. And by that I mean always be willing, if you can, to help another person get a door open, give them a word of advice, a tip of information. Many times it's the little things that can really help and that can really count. And go back to your high school. Go back while you're in your early 20s. Let the young people see you say, I sat right there and I was you. And like you, I was nervous and I was scared and I didn't know what was going to come of me. But I put my head down and I held my head high. And look at where I am today, a college graduate from the University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff. Don't forget from when she came. Every one of you will be great because you are great. Every one of you was given by God incredible talent and skill. The only question is, are you going to develop it? Or are you going to hone it? Are you going to shine it? Are you going to make it what it can be? So young people, during Black History Month, you are Black History. You are Black History. You are Black History in the making. In the making. What you do today and what you do tomorrow will make history for a generation 25, 50, or 100 years later. I don't think that Carter G. Woodson was thinking every day, well, you know, if I create Black Negro History Week, then I'll win an award. Or I'll be a great man and people will laud me 50 years after I'm dead. He wasn't thinking. He was thinking about contributing. So University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, let us lift our heads, let us lift our hearts, and let us remember the history of our people is a great history. It's a wonderful history. We have to learn it, we have to spread it, we have to respect it, and we have to love it. God bless you, and I thank you for listening to me this morning. And we realize that you are on a tight schedule and we have to get you out of here no later than 12.15. But we want to thank you so much for coming. We do probably have a couple of questions that we might be able to entertain okay. by the audience for your response. Thank you. Good morning. My Good name morning. is Ronnie Knox. I am currently a junior here at the university majoring in industrial technology management and applied engineering. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could give me some advice because currently I am a resident of Palm of Arkansas, I'm born and raised here, and I am involved in a, a civil lawsuit against the city because I actually feel like that they are trying to keep me from progressing and trying to keep me, really trying to kill me. So just a word of advice, encouragement for someone that I'm from here and I heard what you said and you know, you have to make sure you remember where you come from. So during this Black History time, I want to make sure that um, I give the city an opportunity to make wrong what was, make right what was wrong. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that when one is involved in a lawsuit, the most important thing is to have a good lawyer. One cannot represent themselves. Representing yourself is like trying to do surgery on yourself. It's not possible to do it effectively because the law is a complicated thing. So I would encourage, that's the most important encouragement that I can give you is to get a lawyer you can trust, a lawyer who you feel will fight for you, and then follow their advice. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jalen Mall, and I'm a senior here majoring in psychology. And my question for you is, as a young man aspiring to be a lawyer, what are some tips or advice that you can give to me? Uh, so, strengthen, work on, hone, refine your writing and speaking skills. Your writing and speaking skills. For a lawyer, the ability to communicate through writing and through speaking are the most important skill sets, basic skill sets of being a lawyer. And so become as good as you can at writing. Uh, become as good as you can if there are debate teams, speaking classes, oratorical contests, participate in that. Because Writing and speaking is like most things. The more you do, the better you get. And I think that on college campuses today, even in graduate schools, we need to create more opportunities for public speaking and public presentation. Because in the business world and in the political world, the ability to make oral presentations many times can be a separator between people who are great and people who are good. And so working to make that really good. And then, and then the, to be a good lawyer, have a good plan and investigate law schools. There are many scholarships out there. There are many opportunities out there. Some of them may be at law schools that are not in a place you may want to live. But law school is three years and out. right? Do your investigating about opportunities and scholarships, etc. But I think writing skills and speaking skills are essential to being a good lawyer. So those things that have you write are important. Those things that give you an opportunity to speak publicly, speak in small groups, refine your oratorical skills, or what you can do at this level. And when it comes time to take the law school aptitude test, take the law school aptitude test preparation course. Standardized tests are not a test of what you know. They're a test of how well you prepare for that test. How well you prepare for that test. I don't care whether it's a GRE, an MCAT, all these tests, you know, you think, oh, I got this, I know this, no. And it's also a, uh, a, a, a challenge of test-taking skills. So take the law school aptitude preparation test. In other words, the study, the study classes, they cost money. You know, but, but I'm saying this because it's about having a plan in advance. Thank you for your question. Good luck. My name is Desmond Sam. I am 24 and an independent student here at the University of Arkansas at Palm Love, major in accounting. My question is, um, what are your plans for the Urban League? Question mark. So, stand up, Sherman. Sherman Tate. So, we just, in 2015, re-entered Arkansas. So, there's a brand new Urban League of Arkansas. And Sherman Tate uh, is chair of the board and one of the founders of our effort here. We have, as a part of our effort, we have the uh, Arkansas Urban League Young Professionals, which are open to people between the ages of 20 and 40. So we need to find out how we can get some information on the campus so that young people can be involved in the work that we do. So we're trying to build a presence here in Arkansas. We were here years ago. We had a 20-year hiatus. But I'm very excited that uh, Sherman and our new uh, Arkansas Urban League CEO, Marquina Newman, uh, is, 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 is really got a great plan to help us build here uh, in Little Rock and Northwest and also Hot Springs, is it? Yes. So raise your hand. Sherman Tate's the man. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. My name is Sakira Harris and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a junior here at the university majoring in elementary education. Throughout your presentation, I was taking notes and things like that, and I wrote down my questions, so I can prepare. Um, so what I wrote down was, considering we were granted our full rights as citizens, like such as voting and things, only less than 60 years ago, 
Um, and the generations before ours were the transitional group from those limitations such, such as segregation. Um, how do we truly enlighten our people that we are so powerful and that we are the chosen people? So, let me kind of put this lens. So, your generation and our generations are now tasked with ensuring that the clock is not turned backwards. Five years ago, six years ago, the Supreme Court disabled a significant provision of the Voting Rights Act. Since that provision was disabled, 40 plus states have sought to pass voter suppression laws. Under the Voting Rights Act, prior to the Supreme Court's action, probably two thirds of those laws would not have gotten through because the Justice Department would have been able to block them because they're discriminatory. So generations today have to protect the progress have to protect the progress and continue to push. And not believe, uh, because a law is on the books, it's going to stay on the books. Right. People try to repeal them. People challenge them in court. People try to undercut it. People try to say, administrations come in and say, well, I'm just not going to enforce that provision of law. I won't enforce it. I'll just ignore it. So we have to fight. To, that's why voting and participating in the political process is so important. Last night, I had a chance to meet the new mayor of Little Rock in office for less than uh, less than a month. Uh, first African American man elected mayor of Little Rock. Very young man. We had a chance to talk, uh, and you know he's a product of people getting out to vote. He's a product of his ability to build a coalition uh, of all people to to be able to vote. So we've got to protect that progress. Thank you very much. No Before the next question, I'd like to kind of piggyback on what you just said. Yeah. The mayor of Pine Bluff is the first black female. To oh, yes. Sure. Okay. Is she here? I don't think she is. Well, let's give her a hand. Good afternoon. And hey, the choir deserves a Grammy in my estimation. <laughs> give it up. You all are strong. Excellent. Hello, my name is Kadarius Knapper. I am a junior here at the university, majoring in psychology, and I am from Texarkana, Arkansas. I aspire to one day to be the Arkansas governor. And my question to you is, how do you handle diversity in the political world? I believe that uh, African Americans can represent all people. I believe that African Americans have the ability to not just represent the interests of black people, but to represent the interests of all people. Uh, and we have to remember that. We don't, we don't want to get pigeonholed, cubbyholed, just like African Americans have voted for white candidates since the beginning of time. And how white candidates, uh, their white candidates that we uh, uh, know have been able to effectively represent our interests. And so we need to understand that the politics of the future is really coalition building. The ability of candidates, regardless of race, to build beyond a political base, to try to represent broad cross-sections of people and find common ground. That is going to be the politics of the 21st century. That's what's going to animate things, right? The ability to, to represent broad sections of people in public office and to do it, do it effectively. Uh, and to do it with, uh, with a sense of integrity and a sense of purpose. And so, uh, uh, what year are you running? Have you uh, figured that out yet? 2032, I believe. All right, so you know what? Let's circle the date on our calendar. Right. Be on the lookout. Yeah, be on the lookout. Thank you, Mr. Morrow, and we appreciate it very yeah. much. We I know that you're in a yeah. rush. I appreciate everyone letting me. I got to get back home because today is Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, I want to give I want to give my wife a kiss before midnight. <laughs> so uh, I gotta go catch this plane out a little while. Thank you all for having me, Chancellor. Good luck and let me know what I can do at the university. Appreciate all of you all. God bless and good luck.
So in closing of this program, I would like to thank everybody who put in time to make this event happen. Uh, I'd like to thank students and faculty who attended and any guests who came today. I would also like to extend a golden line thank you to our speaker, Mr. Mark Morial, who gave us a great word today. And I implore every person in this room to find any anecdote from Mr. Morial's speech to apply to their own life. The purpose of these events is not simply to bring a speaker for entertainment or say that we brought someone of great stature to our school, but the purpose is to bring people who have already contributed greatly to the black community who can give us as students insight into what we can accomplish if we allow ourselves to be challenged and accept the responsibility of being change makers in our society. And if we're gonna be change makers, we have to remember what Mr. Morial said and protect the progress and vote. He warned us of the warfare being made against us and Michelle Obama said, don't boo vote. We owe it to ourselves and those who came before us who couldn't to vote. And in finality, we have uh, the retiring of the colors and the singing of the Na Negro National Anthem. During this time, we ask for no movement and to wait until the conclusion of the Negro National Anthem to move about the auditorium. Retire the colors. Order on. Thank you, you are dismissed.